Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by AWS Activate. It's easy to start and scale your business with Amazon Web Services. Check out free resources like one-on-one -on -one office hours with AWS Solutions Architects and much more. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups. Today on the program, my guest, legendary VC, former host of This Week in Venture Capital, blogger at both sides of the table, and recently got the monkey off his back with the huge sale of Maker to the Walt Disney Company for like a half bill, maybe wound up being a bill. Mr. Mark Suster is with us. Stick around, it's gonna be an amazing episode. That's what it's all about, man. They said, funny is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Ah, uh, hey everybody, hey everybody. Uh, this is This Week in Startups. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter. I am at Jason. Yes, I'm showing off that I have my first name on Twitter. Hey, um, if it's your first time listening to the program, what do we do here? We talk about startups, entrepreneurship, angel investing, venture capital investing, building companies, it's just, you know, the whole um, range of that. And it's um, it's been five years of doing this show, and a couple of years into doing it, uh, I met a guy named Mark Suster, and he did This Week in Venture Capital. He was a guest on the program. Everybody loved him as a guest, but then he wound up hosting his own show uh, with me and I did a great like job. I was like Stephen Colbert or something, right? You were like, like the Stephen Colbert, right, right. You follow, <laughs> follow my uh, lead in. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And... Um, uh, gosh, what a great run he's had as an angel investor of as a venture capitalist of late, and we'll get into that in a minute. If you want to get uh, even deeper into the program, go to Twist List, T W I S T. That's the you know handle for the show. Twist this week in startups. Get it? Uh, go to twistlist.co and you can join the Twist List, which is a secret. Uh, email list where there's 250 of the super fans of the show. So like there's 100,000 people downloading every episode, 250 people. It's like 25 basis points of the show. It's basically where the real deep conversations from the super fans go. And you can sign up there for like two bucks a month or 100 bucks a month, whatever you feel like paying. It's sort of like one of those give what you want, like Kickstarter kind of things. And uh, twistlist.co if you want to join us. And I'm active on it. I read every email and it's great discussions. It's awesome. It's a lot of fun, actually. I enjoy it. All right. Mark Suster's with us. And uh, you've been a VC for how long? I've been a VC since 2007, right. so going on seven years. Right. Um, as I said on my blog, um, I actually didn't write a check for a year and a half. Right. So I joined officially September 2007. Uh, I spent 2007 and into 2008 trying to figure out my craft. Yeah. There w it wasn't crazy like it is today. There weren't so many deals. There right. wasn't seed deals. You know, it wasn't in such a rush. People weren't that public back then. Twitter was kind of new, whatever. Yeah. And so I spent a bit of time. And just as I got ready to do my first couple of investments, late 2008, of course, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Yeah, Bear Stearns. And I started wondering, instead of venture capital, if I should buy guns and protect myself. It was a, it got a, it was a little dicey there when the when the Dow hit like six thousand or seven thousand. I was. It was below seven. It was below seven. It was like six and change. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was at the Allen and Company retreat in Arizona which I, I'm not supposed to talk about. But anyway, they have like a retreat, you know, a bunch of yep. baller CEOs. And I was with like a fidelity guy, you know, all these like big muckety mucks, uh, you know, from the finance world. And this one guy says, yeah, this could go to two. Two. Yeah. 20%. Yeah, I, I mean, remember. people don't remember exactly how bad it was then. What kind of effect does that have on a venture capitalist? Because don't you get your money and you can invest it anyway? Yeah. So you have nothing to worry about? Well, or do you have something to worry about? Let me say it this way. First of all, it wasn't the first correction that I had seen, nor the first you had seen. No. 
Uh, we both lived through 2001, which was, I think, uh, the first week of March 2001. And that extended on, you know, for many years, probably. Through 9-11. Yeah. Well, then you had 9-11. Yeah, it was a double whammy. Yeah. Double whammy. And it was that 2000 and 2001. You just continued exactly. and continued. That was but, like then, but then really it was became impossible to raise funds in 02, 03, 04. It's very Venture difficult. Fund, uh, no, for Startups. entrepreneurs to oh, raise impossible. money from VCs. And uh, the interesting thing is, having lived through those periods of time, it really changes you. I always tell entrepreneurs, you need to be able to, if you really want to build a real company, hmm. you have to think of it on a seven to 10 year trajectory. Hmm. And in a seven to 10 year trajectory, you're going to have a recession. Right. right? Just generally statistically. speaking, statistically speaking, yeah. you're, you're likely to have a recession. Yeah. So you need to plan a business that'll work in good times and bad. It can't just be the Good Time Express. Um, and I also tell people that... What, what should be in that plan? Um, well, I think you need to be careful about not locking in super big fixed costs that you can't recover from. Fixed costs being what? A well, lease? so for example, let's take a case study, Exodus. Do you remember Exodus? Exodus, yeah. yeah. That was the big uh, internet provider. Internet hosting. Hosting, you know, yeah. it, was, it was, I think at the time, the world's largest. Yeah. And they were expanding incredibly fast all over the world, but they took out tons of debt to finance the building of their mm -hmm. facilities, and they couldn't access capital markets, and they went bankrupt. Ah. So all, that happens to companies. Yeah. Um, so what I like to tell people is, first of all, raise money when it's available, mm. right? And money's available now. Oh, my God, is it? It is available now. And it it's hard to understand if you've only been an entrepreneur since 2009, you don't know, you don't, you probably don't remember RIP good times, right? Like you no. don't remember the memos that went out. Sequoia famously the, sent the, a, a, a pitch deck out saying RIP good times, yeah. be prepared for how bad this was. And they were right in the short term, but it got much better quicker than most people thought. Yeah, that is true. No. And uh, I think you just need to understand that there are good times, there are bad times. The funny thing about venture funding for entrepreneurs is that the whole market is flowing and then it shuts off immediately. If mm. you ever read the book, The Black Swan, I don't yep. remember, you know, it was yep, uh, sure. Nassim Taleb. Taleb yeah. And he basically said that all returns in markets are not driven by averages, but they're driven by extreme events that you can't right. predict. And when they happen, they cause massive shifts in markets. And, you know, I had read that book in 2007, and my wife still thanks me to this day. I sold all my stock before the market crashed wow. because I, it was such a profound impact on me uh, reading that book. But anyway, uh, so what I like to tell people is raise money when it's available and understand that when it shuts off, hmm. it shuts off absolutely nothing gets through for a period of time. That might be three months, it might be six months, it might be two years. And so I tell people, you know, that they have to have that in mind. Now, you asked me a question, which was, what happens to VCs? Yeah. If you did a whole bunch of investment of really large checks at super high prices, what happens then is you go into triage. You're like, which one of these are going to survive, right? Right. And you start calling all your co-investors saying, should we each put another three or $5 million in this deal? So you spend all your time working with co-investors, looking at restructuring, looking at cost cutting, looking at triage. Save, save the kids. You've got yeah. a certain amount of food. You got a certain amount of medicine. Yeah, I guess Sophie's yeah. choice, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then let alone raising a new fund, because when the markets hit, it also hits LPs, the people who invest in VC funds. Yeah. So if you've raised a new fund and you're not overextended on your investment, you're fine. So we at Upfront, we were lucky, honestly, on timing. We had a brand new fund. We hadn't invested it yet. Right. And we had all of our previous investments from the last fund that were going well. So we didn't have a bunch of new investments. So but you guys were scared. Oh, Nervous. everyone was scared. Yeah. The whole market was scared. How, terrified or scared? Terrified. Terrified. I was yeah. terrified a little bit. I was now. terrified for my physical security and well-being. Like, I I could see doomsday scenario. It did seem like if another one of those banks shut down, yeah. you could just have a run on the banks. Because when that when the people were leaving Bear Stearns or couldn't get into the building and you were watching that on CNBC, and the CNBC commentators who are like, you know, they've been doing this forever. It's sort of like the, and they're kind of like. Let's put it this way, Jason. They don't know what's going on. Let me talk about a high class problem. Yeah. The FDIC will insure up to $100,000 per institution. Right. Everybody I knew that had money was trying to figure out how to move their money out of institutions to cap the amount of 
banks that they had with $100,000 because you didn't know if you were going to be protected for more than that. Right. There I were, know that's a high class problem, but like that's how bad it was. People were doing crazy stuff like that. Yes. Um, but it all worked out. I, I would encourage people if you want to understand history and understand how stuff like this really could happen and that it's not so crazy to think about Armageddon is to read a book. I mean, there's many books you could read. Uh, one I particularly liked was Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Mm. And it talked about trade, global trade, and how the Silk Route was set up yep. and how global trade emerged and how world order emerged. And the Middle Ages came about because of the Black Plague. And what happened was you had the global trade system, but because of the Black Plague, no one wanted to travel, so no trade took place. So all global economies broke down, all regional economies broke down, and wow. everyone who had power and infrastructure and wealth and money were eradicated, and we wow. were set back to zero. And it's not so far-fetched. Genghis Khan. And the making of the modern and the world. the making of the modern world. There's your audible choice for the day. There it is on Audible. It's very good. Very Audible's good not book. sponsoring this episode, but I love Audible, and they've been a long-term sponsor for me for five or six years, so I give them a free ad right there. All right, when we get back from the commercial break, speaking of commercials, I want to have an honest discussion about Maker. Okay. Because yeah. a lot of people were thinking Maker mm -hmm. could be a zero. That was a mm -hmm. little buzz. Not like everybody, but it's like 10% of people were like, this is a really, you know, machinima and maker are going into the ground. And Those were uninformed people. Of course. But there were rumors of losing a couple million dollars a month, which is not uncommon. But boy, was this something that happened with this Disney that nobody expected Disney would come in when the ecosystem, YouTube ecosystem, was so troubled mm -hmm. and people felt was fundamentally broken. And then this massive Chase, shell occurs. There was, but there, wait, okay. save it for but wait, there's more. Break. Yeah. Save it as a tease. Yeah, that's is, I'm trying to we'll tease do the it. Tease. Do the little bit of a but tease. But there is a good story to tell after know, the break. It's such a great story to tell after this important break. Hey, listen, Walker Corporate Law is run by my friend Scott Ed Walker. He is a great guy. He's been sponsoring and partnering with me on this program, live events, everything. He's a complete mensch. Um, he's a boutique law firm, and he encourages fixed fees. You know what this is like, Mark, when you get that legal bill, and like yeah. you got to go like talk to the law firm, like, hey, it's not reasonable. Like You yeah. do that on behalf of your startup sometimes. I intentionally say I want fixed fees up front. Right. And you can't negotiate them, I and it's good that people like Scott are willing to sign yeah. up to that. All their lawyers have 10 to 20 years experience. There's no junior associates getting on-the-job training. They do mergers and acquisitions, licensing agreements, terms of service, all that stuff. And I had, you know, I have uh, tons of young startups, 15% of the people who come to the launch festival, it's their first time in San Francisco. The hackathons, you know, 100 projects finish. A lot of them uh, have never incorporated a company, just that basic blocking and tackling. And some of them have IP issues. We just had one where two people, a third person joined the hackathon. Two people were partners. They added a person to the hackathon who was a teenager. Does that person get equity in the new startup even though they're going back to school and they have no interest in the startup? Oh boy, complicated issues, legal issues, and you need to have a really great guy like Scott Walker on your team. Call him 415 979 9998-415-979-9998, or Scott at Walker Corporate Law. Thanks again, Scott. Okay, so um, the last year or two, the YouTube ecosystem has been feast and famine. I think we would all agree people see this massive amount of uh, views and brands being built, like just colossal numbers in terms of growth mm -hmm. and views, but really uh, challenged on the revenue from dollar CPMs. Um, and then Maker had raised a ton of money, had a ton of costs, lawsuits, turnovers, all this stuff. Tell us about this company and how it was able to thread the needle. So let's state a couple things. Yeah. First of all, um, I think it's important, and I try to educate journalists about this all the time, because everyone gets caught on this issue of, are you losing money? There's a tension on one side between growth mm -hmm. and on the other side between profits. Right. It's very easy to build a profitable company with four people in it that grows at like 8% a year, right? Yeah, service business. And, or, or be ramen profitable or whatever. Sure. Uh, investors only care about one thing. Growth. And that is? Growth. Now, it has to be growth with high enough gross margin, mm -hmm. right? They don't want low, high growth, low gross margin, mm. uh, but a high gross margin, high growth business is the most valuable thing that there is to investors. And an example of a high, one of the best would be what? Well, I'm sure Uber. 
yeah. must be on a tear growth-wise. And I'm sure, well, th let me explain just one thing, Jason, which you know, but some of your viewers may not immediately pick up on, is why is there tension between profit and growth? Yeah, why? Because in order to get growth, you often have to invest in advance in engineering, in sales teams. In the case of Uber, in street teams, you've got to build up sure. street teams in every market, right? you got to get um, a, the first 100 cab yeah. uh, so, drivers. So do the math. At Maker, we have 50 engineers. 50. 50. Yeah. Like, do the math on, yeah, you know. 100 and change at, each, all call in. It, call it 100K, all yeah, in. You yeah, know, it's probably a little bit more, but yeah. it's a lot of money. Oh, yeah. We also had to hire a direct sales team. We also wanted to build out marketing. We have whole talent development teams. We do production. Why would we invest all this money in that infrastructure? Tens of millions of dollars. Well, the company was on a nine-figure revenue run rate. Incredible. And by the way, growing at north of 100% year over so year. over a million dollars a month in revenue. Incredible. No, 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 no. Did I quote that wrong? You uh, said nine-figure a month. Nine-figure, then I'm wrong. Sorry. It's, no, no, seven-figure a month. Nine-figure would be $100 million. Yes. Days. Yeah. So they were breaking $10 million in some months. Yes. Incredible. Not in some months. Yeah. Consistently. Yeah. So I can't reveal revenue figures sure. exactly, but I can tell you it's, it's of a that real magnitude, business. right? Yeah. It is, I believe, the fastest growing company in L.A. Yeah. I believe it's one of the fastest growing revenue companies in the country. Really? Yeah. Wow. And I think it will hit a scale... Uh, if we continue to perform well, that will astound people. Hmm. So, yeah, of course, there's a lot of yard barkers who are saying, oh, the company's about to go under. Well, let's look at the facts. We had just raised $72 million. Sure. Right? 72 doesn't evaporate. No. I mean, even if you burn, they were saying it was a burn of two or three million a month, which doesn't seem like a lot if you're making 10, it'd be like 20, 30 percent more. So that's not a lot. You got a lot of months left. We also had, so what determines whether or not you can build a crazy fast growing business that can sustain losses mm -hmm. is one thing and one thing only, which is access to capital. Mm. Do you have access to capital? And Maker had unlimited access to capital. We had people who would have offered us $100 million or more to not sell the company. Really? Yeah. So why did you sell the company if it's growing this well? That's a little bit of a tell. Like, was there some risk factor or is there some thing people were nervous about or the founders just wanted to get out? Why would you sell if you think it's growing that fast? Could it be a multi-billion dollar company then? Look. In every company, as you're growing, first of all, it's management's decision whether or not to sell, and investors, I think, serve at the pleasure of management. And as long as investors... Founders, you mean, yeah. Well, it's not yeah. always founders. Yeah, sometimes it's a higher CEO, yeah. In the case of Maker, you yeah. know, we have a CEO who was not a founder. Right. But truthfully, also, the founders played a huge role in yeah. stewarding the company and deciding whether or not we should stay independent or sell. And when we looked at it, we basically said there's this, the most creative media company in the world that acquired Star Wars, you know, Lucas Marvel. Films. It acquired Marvel. It acquired Pixar. Yeah. Right? It owns some of the best assets in the world, if not the best assets no, in the world. No, it does. The best assets. And when, best, I, best IP in the world. And clearly. when that company says, We've decided that short form video is tremendously important to the future of our company yeah. and building authentic relationships with end consumers and tremendously important to the future of our company. And we love what you're doing. Mm. You take the call. OK, let's talk about the YouTube relationship. Yeah, because you've written about it. You talked about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, the two of us were kind of like the voices of like, hey, maybe YouTube could do a little better. Yeah. There was this YouTube risk factor where YouTube was taking 45% of the revenue. You said it's not sustainable to do that. I was saying that as well. Um, and it felt like YouTube didn't want the MCNs to exist anymore. They seem to be taking all the MCN innovations, putting them in the playbook. So looking at Maker, and I heard a lot of this from other MCNs, I won't say which, but and maybe including Maker, but okay, we're gonna build a studio and we're gonna provide resources. And then you see YouTube copy that and do it like maybe 10 times better with their huge facility here. Okay, we have a playbook of how to grow things. They basically photocopy Maker's playbook. All their innovations go to youtube.com slash playbook. Then the uh, Ray Johnson was like the stand-up shows were like the big thing. And then they launched YouTube Nation. And so, and then the big innovation for Maker was also doing these tentpole events and putting a bunch of people together. And collaborations was something they invented over there where one channel, 
and one star would introduce you to another one, and they would do stuff together to send subscribers back and forth. And YouTube creates a department to create collaborators. Mm -hmm. When you're an investor and you see YouTube studying your investor, your investment maker, and stealing all their innovation and putting it into the core platform, what do you think? What are the board meetings like? Well, obviously, I have a slightly different view on what well, Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah. Tell me. Because um, that's a consensus opinion, I think. I, I look at it slightly differently, Jason, which is, first of all, you may know, you do know, uh, YouTube bought Next New Networks. Yep. And the whole idea was to develop in-house skills at YouTube to better serve creators, and they want to serve creators. They want to serve creators directly. Hmm. But they also recognize that people like Maker Studios who are in the business every day of only serving creators. Yeah. Um, are important. Hmm. And uh, YouTube has no problem if 50% of our business is on YouTube and 50% is off of YouTube. You know, as they like to say it, if ESPN decided to put, you know, 5% of their business on YouTube, they would be delighted. Sure. So how could they not want Maker Studios to have 50% of its business off of YouTube? So I, I always used to say to people in the video business, which is, you need to fish in the pond where all the fish are and they're all on YouTube. So right. to try and build your own independent video company at your own in independent site is very expensive to do. Hmm. So I always saw YouTube, and I talked to YouTube directly about this, and they were fine with it, is a place to build audience. It's the top end of the funnel. If you can't convert them to anything else, it's going to be hard to build a sustainable business. So let's look at the margin. They take 45%. Most talent takes about 70%. Hmm. So if you have formats that are just, I'm repackaging existing talent, selling through YouTube, you're making about 17.5% margin. Brutal. Which is an ad network business. It's not valuable, right? right? So what do you need to do? On the distribution side, you've got to build owned and operated websites that you manage. Hmm. You've also got to have output deals like Awesomeness TV does with cable and satellite and other places, right? That helps with economics. You can take some of your shows, package them up, put them on DVD and, and sell mm -hmm. them internationally, right? There's all sorts of things you can do there. Um, on the talent side, you've got to have some shows which are like PewDiePie, where PewDiePie was an international world star before we signed him. Now, he's grown a lot under Maker Studios, but he built his own brand. Mm. So we're never going to have leverage in that deal. But we also need to create formats where we own the format, we do production, and talent comes in stars for us. Mm. So you need a blend of some talent that you're repping, some production that you're producing yourself, and you ought to be able to build a business where you get about 55% margin, which is what most venture capital capitalists are looking for. The other things people need to understand is if you do brand integration, which is not that scalable, but that's 100% revenue, YouTube doesn't yeah. take any. Number two is we sold merchandise. We sold millions of dollars of merchandise per year. We sold millions of dollars of music per year because we did original scores for our show. So our margins are much higher than people thought they were. All right. When we get back from commercial break, let's talk about... Um the YouTube competitors that are coming, and we'll finish up that discussion. Sure. Um, okay, listen, New Relic uh, saved my ass. I, I, I would look at all the copy here, but you know what? I'm just going to go right here. I'm going to cross out all the copy. All you need to know is newrelic.com slash twist, uh, where you can get the free T-shirt from New Relic, because that's how like deep into the This Week in Startups audience they are. They actually made... Um, their own T-shirts for us. I mean, that's kind of like a cool, like I kind of felt really good about that when they did it. Here it is. Look at that beautiful T-shirt, huh? So, um, and that was one of the super fans who actually made the shirt design. So you can get that uh, by going to newrelic.com slash twist, newrelic.com slash twist. Anyway, when we launched inside, we were having all kinds of technical problems. And we didn't have all the server monitoring or any insight into our stack and where the problems were. We are in the weeds. I got VCs. I got investors. I got angels. I got the press. Everybody breathing down my neck, and let alone my friends. Thanks to my friends, this is what you can count on. Your website's down, or you got all kinds of problems. Your friends are calling you. What do you what's going on over there? I thought you were a professional entrepreneur. Your website's going down. I can't load the app. The thing's not working. Oh, my God. I am, like, going mental. So I, like, ping. I throw a bomb over. Hey, guys, New Relic, save me. They get New Relic running on all our servers, and boom, like a laser, they found the code in the uh, Ruby where the problem was, and it was one of our voting things where it was accidentally firing off votes as people swiped through the app. We had no idea what it was. It might have taken us two or three, four, five days to figure it out. They found it out literally in five minutes. It took us like less than an hour to install it. Five minutes later, we know what it is, and then my guys fixed the code in like, whatever, two or three hours. 
disaster averted, right? That's New Relic. And listen, if Twitter had had New Relic in the early days, there would be no fail whale. That's how good it is. Uh, these guys are on a tear. Anyway, um, you get the idea. It's application performance tool. Nike, Warby Parker, Airbnb, Comcast, AT&T. Everybody uses it. I use it. Um, and it's just a great, great product. Go ahead and thank them. Say thank you at New Relic for saving at Jason's ass with at Inside. Go ahead. That'd be a funny tweet. I'll retweet it if you do it. Okay. Thanks at New Relic. Go to newrelic.com. All right. So, but you were frustrated a little bit with YouTube. So I mean, you sound like very magnanimous right now. Is that because you 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 want to maintain the relationship let with me, YouTube, or you you were kind of frustrated? Let me say a couple of things, yeah. Jason. I uh, feel like you're you're sugarcoating a little. I'm not respectfully. But, no, I'm not. But let me, you know, I'm nuanced as a mm -hmm. person. So let me you're say this. Nuanced, yeah. But I'm always nuanced. So yeah. let me say a couple of things. Yeah. One is I will invest more in YouTube. Really? Yeah. Because every VC has said no effing way. That's great. That's awesome. All right, but why are all these VCs saying no effing way? Why did uh, they see, not see the opportunity? Because let's face it, Machinima having problems, you know, uh, people selling, you know, their other MCNs like at whatever less than their valuation or the last round. Like it's been a little rough for everybody but Maker. I think that if you don't have a strategy mm -hmm. for how to increase your margin, mm -hmm. do original production, have other forms of distribution, have engineering that differentiates your product. We had engineering that I think really truly differentiated our product. And if you can't access capital markets to allow mm -hmm. you to sustain losses, it's hard to build a business here. Yeah. But that's true of any startup, right? Absolutely. So I would never build a pure YouTube business. Yeah. My view is the mistake we all made was we saw YouTube as a business, YouTube video as a business, YouTube is a channel. Right. It happens to be the biggest channel today, but you know that's changing. You know that it's Twitter 95 minutes and out of Facebook. Okay, and well, let's talk about Twitter, Facebook, and all these other ones. Uh, who, who would you most like to see get into the video business and take YouTube head on, and why? So let me say what maybe got me in trouble, if you want to say that, yeah. I'm, that I'm sugarcoating things, is I said that I thought Google was suffering from the innovator's dilemma. And what I mean is... If you have a product in which you are so dominant that you earn the right to take whatever rev share you want, hmm. um, and if you do that, that's your prerogative. I believe that. Right. But then you will welcome other people to enter the market and be disrupted, which is the innovator's dilemma. And I always believed the company that would do that was Amazon. Hmm. And the reason I said so was look at what YouTube provides. It provides web hosting. Right, it hosts the EC2. video. <laughs> it has yeah. processing power to process right. the video. It has distributed CDNs, content distribution networks. Um, it has a player, and all of those things Amazon does. That's what you know. W two, you know, EC two and W two, or God, I'm forgetting what it's called. Uh, uh, actually, does, and uh, so between their storage, their distributed network. And their player, they also, Amazon has a very large ad business that people Nobody don't know Nobody don't about. know. In New York, they're making like a billion Huge, dollars a year or something. Billion dollar a and year it's revenue a big, business. big, like, nobody knows. So what they aren't doing today is encouraging short form content to be on a platform that other people uh, uh, consume the video, number one. And number two is they're not selling ads for you. So when you get started, if you don't have capital, if someone mm. else is selling ads, I mean, a lot of these businesses got to a few million dollars of revenue with no ad sales team, which is great. And people don't thank YouTube enough for that. But the 45% is just a real sticking point. I agree. And don't you think I agree. if you were them or any other person, don't you think they should have given a different deal to Maker, investing $100 million in venture cap or whatever it is, $70 million in venture cap? Shouldn't they get a better deal than just anybody walking in off the street who uploads a cat video? I do think so. And what so, should the difference be? Well, I think that one should get volume discounts. So if okay. we're more meaningfully contributing to the ecosystem, we ought to see a higher rev share. What did you um, think it should be ideally for like somebody like Machinima or a Maker? What would you, listen, if you were the, running it, what would you pick? The norm in the industry is 70-30. So you'd pick that? Yeah. And uh, there's all sorts of reasons that YouTube lists where they believe that it should be more because they believe they're providing more value. And that, honestly, I believe that's their prerogative and I still will continue to invest. Do you think they change that on YouTube. this year? No. Do you think they change it next year? No. So they're going to hold their ground? Until they have competition. 
Okay, so let's go transfer. But look at Amazon now, right? You have now the Amazon new TV platform that they're launching yes. to compete with Roku. I think they originally are just going to sell long form video on that. But how long will it be before short form starts to make a bigger appearance on hmm. platforms like Roku, platforms like Amazon? Uh, that's a question. You answer it. I believe it'll be here in the next two, three years. Okay. Um, so Amazon, you think, would be the perfect competitor. Yeah. Let's go down because the list. Because they already have the infrastructure. The infrastructure. The next obvious competitors are Twitter and Facebook. Okay, in my let's mind. do each one. So Twitter, Twitter seems to be more attuned to the opportunity. Hmm. They have hired people who... Baljeet, who, who was the number online. two person at... We're not speaking out of school here. This is yeah. very public. Yeah. They have a team of people, both in music and in video, that understand the space. And they're already hosting 50 partners right now, like NFL and US Open, who are putting actual video clips think about onto it. Twitter. Think, it's think not about it this way. Why do advertisers want video-based advertising? Because that is the best medium for them to build emotional resonance and to tell a story that compels people to buy something. It works. It works. Better than banners. Much better than banners. Better much than better search. Than or, um, or equal? Well, search has something that's unique to it, Jason, which you know and maybe some of your viewers don't, which is called intent. Okay, explain. So if I type in baby stroller, mm -hmm. if I type in purple, purple Nike shoes, or if I type in uh, purple shoes, yeah. um, I'm showing an interest or an intent to purchase. Mm. And intent to pur purchase turns out to be the most profitable business probably that exists in the world. Right. It's like reading people's minds, yeah. which could never be done previously. Right. And so that's valuable. But I think video online advertising is increasingly going to be enormously valuable. And imagine the future. So what, a lot, again, a lot of people don't understand is if you put something in YouTube, it's in a YouTube wrapper, a YouTube player. And then anywhere you distribute that on the web, it has a YouTube ad associated with right. it. It's only amount of time before that video is outside of its wrapper in Facebook, outside huh. of its wrapper on Twitter, and they are going to sell the pre-roll or the translucent ad. Wow. Um, they have to. And also, it seems to me like somebody like, say, Ellen DeGeneres, who has 28 million followers on, uh, 28 million followers Ellen DeGeneres has on Twitter. I was told kind of through the grapevine that Ellen had one of those grandfathered in deals where she got like 90% of the revenue or something incredible. You heard that too? I don't know about Ellen, but I do know that they had grandfather deals. And I think over time, those will be and managed out. And they ripped out. it out for Ellen. Yeah. Which has pissed off the company that she's associated with. Warner. Yeah. They're pissed is what I, oh, somebody told me over cocktails. I wouldn't and, be surprised. And she has 28 million followers. Mm -hmm. If she just uploaded her videos to Twitter... Where she, I checked her like Bitly link. She gets like 50, 100, 150 click-throughs. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Like in the first hour. What impact would Ellen moving to Twitter's video platform have? It's not an if, it's a when, right? Oh, really? Yeah, for sure. I mean, okay. people are going to start putting video directly on Twitter. They're going to put video directly on Facebook. We know that's going to happen. We know they're talking to people. I don't think that means YouTube goes away. No. It just means they start to have competition, which is good for all of us. I would How? argue including them. Because why? Well, I mean... You think they're out of touch? Competition drives innovation. Ah. And, I mean, imagine a world in which there was only an iPhone and no Android. Right. You know, Apple would be even worse of an actor than they are today. Right. And they Why would are they a bad actor in your mind? Well, closed the, ecosystem? I think yeah, I always say Apple's like China. Hmm. For the most part, their leadership is benevolent and brings more good to the community. Right. But on the other hand, they decide they don't like fart jokes and they don't like women in bikinis and yeah. they don't like political satire. They don't like Bitcoin. Yeah. So in a way, it's... Nuking a Bitcoin was kind of crazy. It's a dictatorship. And I understand that sometimes dictatorships can produce great dams by wiping out thousands of people and that drives efficiency for everybody. But I'd rather live in a messy democracy that, you know, has more respect for individual rights. And it's kind of like in China, you can make tons of money and they're open for business until one day they decide they don't want you open for business. They take you out back and shoot you in the head and didn't even tell you it was coming. I think that's a little bit like Apple. 
Yeah. You know, like WWDC, like the yeah. New York Times writes a story after every WDC, which companies died, which right. companies got shot. And it's not like they say, hey, guys, we're thinking about moving into your area. How about if you pivot your business model? You're just dead. All right. We have a YouTube video from a YouTube question from the chat room. Are you kidding? OK. Why? Oh, I see. I thought it was an actual video. Why won't YouTube invest grant money to other companies, tools, analytics into the ecosystem? It gave tons of content companies, but none to the other companies. What do you, why do you think that is? And, and do you think the tools inside of YouTube is a good business? I don't think that YouTube has a responsibility to invest in third-party companies full stop. Mm -hmm. They chose to invest in content. It was... Uh, self-motivated mm -hmm. i mean they got recoupment of their investment against advertising yeah. right it's actually so, happening our, our content will all i mean i'm probably not supposed to say but i think our content will all recoup in a couple of years so here's an interesting one jason that i don't talk about very much but i've invested in a tools company that mm. works inside of the youtube ecosystem really which one it's called epoxy tv epoxy tv pull it up Gina. my thesis on epoxy tv is really mm. simple I believe in a world of fragmented video. Mm -hmm. I believe way more is going to go on Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. Yahoo, and other platforms. And in a world in which I just upload my videos to YouTube and everything works, and I just have to work on how to do brand integration, like I don't need tools, uh, or I, I use the ones that YouTube uh, provide me. But in a world where I also have to put it on Instagram and Vine and mm -hmm. in the future Roku and Amazon, like how the hell are you going to do all that? Yeah. And what Epoxy does is it takes your video and it helps you distribute it across all these platforms. Uh. So I want to give you a couple examples on Facebook. If you put a video on Facebook, someone watches it, they're done, and then they go on to read about someone's baby or breasts or whatever, yeah. right? What Epoxy does is they have a Facebook canvas. So when you watch the video, let's say I click on a video mm -hmm. and let's say it's part of a four episode Right, run. they give you the playlist. They say, hey, you should watch episode number one first. Much more efficient. And then it directs you to two, three, and four or whatever you want to put on it, right? right? So it gives you as a video producer huge uplift. We've shown 157% uplift yeah, in video consumption. YouTube's never going to make a tool that goes cross-platform. Well, that's not even YouTube. That's Facebook, right? Right, so, but I'm saying YouTube would never yes, make a tool correct. that says, click here to export my stuff but honestly, to Facebook. But honestly, YouTube's been supportive. They're not yeah. unsupportive of it. And we also have a Twitter product. Mm. So when you watch a video on Twitter, you don't want them to watch one video. If you if you got them hooked, why yeah. not have them watch four videos? So we do totally that makes sense. within Twitter. Here's another interesting thing. We can take a video that was three and a half minute. Now, what people do on Vine is they shoot on their mobile phones, mm. and the quality is much lower. What they do on Instagram, they shoot on their mobile phone. But what they shoot on YouTube is much higher quality video equipment. Mm. So we have a tool now that allows you to take that video, the high mm. quality stuff, and select a six second or 15 second spot. Oh, Post it to Vine? Yeah. Oh, I want that. Right? So what's what, the name of this coming in? Epoxy, epoxy TV. Epoxy.tv. Epoxy. 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 See, that's, I was wondering because I saw some people, and I think some people were like, oh, it's cheating or whatever. And I was like, no, I don't think it's cheating. I think it's like smart. Like, you got to get these clips onto Vine. And like, I don't want to like do a Vine clip it's where it's promotional, right? And yeah. and someone wants to watch we'll it. Look at you that, that, Gina. Format. We should maybe do that for this week in Starters where we do like a six second clip of. You know, so who smart. uses it? Disney uses it. Warner course, uses it. Course. Machinima uses it. Maker Studio uses it. Style Hall uses it. Uh, Me Too uses it. Um, let's talk about some of your other investments. It, sure. It was really great for you to get the maker acquisition done. Yes. Because you had in whatever number of years as a VC now, seven years, no exits. Five years of investing. I did have exits. Of, okay. I just didn't have any of this magnitude. The exits were what? Singles? Well, Doubles? D depends on your definition of singles, doubles. I'd probably call them doubles. Okay. But, um, Which is what? Double your money? Well, triple your money? For, for example, yeah. uh, Gravity was acquired by AOL for $92 million. Yeah. And you invested at a $5 million valuation? I, I, I can't talk about exact valuation, but let me say it returned 42% of all invested capital of my newest fund. Okay. So, so that's funds not usually bad. like two or 300 million bucks. So yeah, that's great. So uh, what I would say to you is I'd had exits, but Maker has returned significantly more than all of the investments I've done in five years. Right. And it it just, you know, it, so Jason, this is how I said it. Like someone asked me on Quora, is Mark Schuster a good VC or not? Right. I saw that answer. The thing I love about Quora and the thing I hate about Secret, on Quora, anyone can ask an anonymous question, 
but then I have a right to write a response, and right. other people do. And if I write a good response, people vote it up. Yeah. If I write a douchey response, people vote it down. Right. And I love the combination of pseudonymity or anonymity with the ability to respond. So what they said is, is he a good VC? And I answered it four years ago, and I answered mm. it truthfully. And here it is. I said, what does it take to be a good investor? I think I'm pretty good at identifying deals. Mm. I think I'm pretty good at working with entrepreneurs and helping and coaching. I agree with that, them. yeah. I think I'm pretty good at helping get downstream investors on board. What Downstream investors means like the later rounds. Yeah, people who will put more yeah. money in the company. What I How do you do that as a, let me before, sorry, before, how do you do that as an investor? So I just, I'll finish 10 okay, seconds yeah, and come okay. back, which is um, the f one thing I hadn't proven, which is the one yardstick where my returns. investors measure me as returns. Yeah. And I said, I think the returns will come. But here's the problem, Jason, is that great returns come in year seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Right. If I'm selling in years one, two, three, and four, it's yeah. probably singles and doubles. And mm. people market the hell out of their singles and doubles like they're the second yeah. coming, but... LPs are looking for the mega returns. LPs and this was look a on mega what? Return. Cash on cash? I put in 100K as an LP or a million as an LP so and I got back X amount back? What LPs should care about is IRR. Right. So to explain it to your viewers is cash on cash means I put a million dollars in and I got $3 million back, right? Okay. So I got a 3X on my money. Well, a 3X on your money in 20 years is much worse than a 2X on your money in six months. Of course. So the 2X in six months is a higher IRR, internal rate of return. So the, the yearly rate of return. Yes. So what's important about that is if I give you the money back quickly with a very high return, you can redeploy that in other investment opportunities. So, um, so they should care about IRR, but they mostly measure cash on cash. Um, were you nervous about your performance as not a VC? Not in the slightest. No you, you, no, you knew it would work out. So there are two metrics for a VC that most people don't know. Right. DPI and TVPI. Okay. DPI. I don't is, even know these. DPI is distributions per invested capital. Okay. TVPI is total value per invested capital. What it, DPI means is realizations or exits are really returning cash. Right. That's the ultimate measure of a VC. Sure. But TVPI is an interim measure, which is take DataSift, okay? Mm. I, have, I was the first, thank you, I was the first investor in DataSift, first institutional investor in data. And data Sift is a data company that lets you tap into the Twitter, initially the Twitter firehose, but many other firehoses and big data companies. I would describe it as a real-time data processing platform. Yeah. So working with some of the largest companies in the world, we allow you to process in real-time billions of transactions. Hmm. We were most famous for Twitter data initially. Yeah. It's a much like Nip. Nip smaller, was the other smaller portion of what we do. Yes, that is our main competitor. But what we allow you to do is if you want to find, uh, let's say, African-American people in the south of Florida who are Republican, who are between 20 and 45, who have sent out negative tweets about Mitt Romney, right? You can do that, and you can do it with a visual query builder. You literally just drag yeah, I've used slides. the builder. It's pretty yeah. slick. And you drag these slides, and out pops a data set. Yeah. And by the way, if you tweeted a negative article about Mitt Romney but didn't mention him in your tweet, we still know it mm. because we grab the link and we crawl all of the content associated with it to find keyword density to serve mm. up the information. So it's a very powerful platform growing very fast. Um, and I have a huge markup on that because we raised $42 million last year at a so nice it's unrealized, markup. but you got the markup so you can yeah. mark to the market yes. as it were. That's called mark to market. So my TVPI was already very good. Mm. Um, so I felt in a good place and I felt like these were companies that were supported by underlying revenue, not just by fundraising. Mm. So it wasn't like Viddy mm. where they raised 30 million at a $270 million valuation with no revenue, mm. right? Like I have very robust revenue growth in data sift. Were you in, in Vidi Invoca? Vidi or no, no. You it. in data sift, in Invoca, in maker studios, like real revenue businesses. So I felt okay. You, uh, put in a slight um, uh, piece there about secret app for yes. people who don't know. Explain what the secret app is and why you've been very public about saying you would never invest in it. So secret allows you to, along with Whisper, which is in LA here, allows you to anonymously post stuff, which is not tied to you at all. And some people say it's not truly anonymous because they tie it to your mobile phone number mm. and they tell you whether the person who's posting it is a friend 
or a friend of a friend, right? right? And they also show you other stuff. They'll just say, here's someone in LA. Right. And what I don't like about it is if you spend time on secret, and I publish a bunch of stuff on my blog, both sides of the table, that showed this, there's a lot of misogyny there. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of uh, anti-gay stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I posted a thing which is someone said, that moment where you pull up at a traffic light in front of a fat chick and want to hit your gas pedal. And I'm like... Really? Right? Yeah. And it had 12 people who had hearted it, right? That's, you know, but so all of that I can live with, okay? Like people saying terrible things. It's the kind with of anonymity. stuff. It's yeah. the kind of stuff you'd write on a bathroom wall, right? So, so, so fine, right? Like that stuff exists. I'm a big boy. Yeah. But then people take out personal attacks. I'll give you examples. Robert Scoble. Someone wrote on Secret, I saw Robert Scoble at a conference and he punched me. Right. And Robert, who I'm friends with and friends with on Facebook, wrote this ludicrous story saying, I never punch anyone in my life. Have you seen me? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, I'm uh, a big teddy bear. <laughs> so, so someone... Couldn't punch his way out of a brown paper bag. Someone wrote about me, and I'm okay with it. I, I amplified it, Jason. Yeah. Someone said, Mark Schuster is a total fraud. He's the exact opposite of how he writes on his blog. Okay? Fine. Okay. I amplified it because I put it right on my blog. I won't hide from that. But... I find that a terrible world for us to live in where people mm. can accuse you of something, slander you, and you've got no retribution, and the, no... Particularly, you know, you could, there's nothing to stop anybody from doing this on the open web right now. Sure. However, when it gets broadcast like it does to everybody in your phone book, and this is what I think people are missing, because they haven't seen it in operation, when it gets shared amongst your phone book, it takes on a life of its own. It would be like taking the bathroom graffiti that was written at 2 a.m. by and some drunk sending it to all your friends. And immediately handing it to everybody on a piece of paper saying, you know, Mark Suster beats his dog. At least on Quora, I have the opportunity to respond. Sure. Now, I want to say something. There which it is. is. Mark Suster is a huge fraud. Yeah. There you well, picture you in the see, studio. You see, I'm willing to... Uh, and it was a friend it. of yours? <laughs> well, but here's the thing, Jason. I add every person I meet at a conference Me anywhere thousands of to my phone book because sure. I just take my stack of it business could be somebody cards. Also I, have my, joke. Yeah. I have thousands and thousands sure. of people who I in my phone book. So, yeah, a friend in so much as it's in my contact book. Yeah. Um, and so my argument was it's okay, look, you can't stop this stuff from being posted, but I flagged it. Hmm. I flagged it as inappropriate, and I called a friend of mine who told me it was out there because I don't have secret on my right. phone, and asked him to flag it. You and then a it, few more happened. people flagged it, and nothing happened. Right. And that was my biggest complaint. Now they seem to really be on top well, of it. Well, I have to say, in their defense, yeah. I wrote this pretty harsh right. blog post about it. They didn't attack me. They were very gracious on Twitter saying, we heard your uh, complaint. Yeah. And they actually wrote a feature well, I to think, try and ameliorate things. I think they are fighting for their lives right now because most people think that what they've built should not exist in the world. That so I be. challenge them on a couple of things. Now, I think for adults, it's fine. If adults want to participate in this kind of thing, it's fine. But for kids, this is something that has been proven with Form Spring and other things. Form Spring and right. Juicy Campus right. and all the ones so that I have come before So I called them out on it. that because yeah. I had Michael from Whisper on the, on the program. Now, Whisper doesn't have this, like, broadcast at your phone book. Mm -hmm. And they have people reviewing all the posts and making sure that stuff isn't going on or something close to that, something close to all, when there's a proper name what in there. With the checking. secret defenders. But they only do adults. You can't yeah. be a kid in the system. But what the secret uh, defender said is they said, look, the company only has six people. Clearly, they're going to ramp up and, and provide yeah. many of the same services. And I think they will. My only point was err on the side of caution. Yeah. I hate apps like this. I think it's um, it brings out our worst self. And yeah. honestly, what I will you say— You have to wonder about a founder who—this is what I think. And I, again, I don't want to beat up on any founder because I'm an angel investor and I'm high profile and I understand that. But I think what you build speaks to who you are. That's what I believe in the world. What you put out in the world represents you. So what is the, and this is why I invited them on the program. They said they were going to come on, and then they backed out because they knew I was going to challenge them. But why does this, why would you build this? Who would build this? What is the need? Do you think this is for whistleblowers? Do you think it's for people? I understand secret because I've, I'm, I'm sorry, whisper, because whisper is like more like post-secret where people would just express themselves, something that was causing anxiety. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't called like secret 
where I want to get you. Mm -hmm. I know your secret, and I'm going to get you. And that's what the app has going for it with this address book. Look, I think that they seem like decent, respectable people, mm. and I think they I will come to the right conclusions over time. Yeah. I think that they got caught in a whirlwind because it became very popular, but it speaks to a broader thing, Jason, which, which is, is Silicon Valley many times has this perception that they're above it all, that uh, you know we're the place where we only care about goodness in the world and making the world a better place. And what it's exposed is that there's a lot of people in Silicon Valley that honestly are the same as people in LA, yeah. the same as people in New York and Chicago and Miami, yeah. that if you give them a platform where it'll cater to their lowest forms of yeah. their worst behavior. Our devils. My, my, my example was this. If you see someone in a grocery store and they cut you off and they say, oh, I'm really sorry, you just let them pass and you'd say, yeah. hey, no big deal. Go right, ahead sure. of me, right? You see that same person in a car who accidentally cuts you off, you'll risk your own life to flag them down to flip them off or cut them off or it's get them back. It's crazy in LA, man. And it, but it's everywhere. It brings out the worst in us. Yes. And apps like this, I think, bring out the worst psychology in people. I challenged them very publicly on the, um, you know, on, on the Twitter mm -hmm. about the suicide issue, and they were like, "Well, we hired the woman who did PR and marketing and communication, Marcoms, we call it marketing communications, for Formspring mm -hmm. to come handle this." And I said, "Okay, well, obviously you have a deeply vested interest in making sure this doesn't happen again because you worked at a company where." large number of kids were tortured mm -hmm. and s tragically there are many suicides that are attributed to the bullying that was created through an anonymous platform like that that was growing like a weed and of course bullying occurs in the real world but it gets accelerated with these tools and they were really upset at me for even talking about suicide and i was like I kind of think that this is the core issue here is the cyberbullying of kids and suicide. I mean, slander for adults. Adults can sue each other. But, but listen, Jason, I was— And why would you hire— I, let me, I, let me was, I was bullied. I mean, I was yeah. bullied on that platform, but the thing is I have a megaphone and a thick skin, and I don't give, yeah. him, I don't give a fork. Yeah, what if you were depressed and your company was failing? You might, you might kill yourself. Right? We've seen that happen Yeah, exactly. to, to I mean, people I, we know. Yeah. I mean, what, imagine if that was the case, and Eco Mom was like— Oh my God! You know, like not if it's the case, Jason. When it's the case. Yeah, when it's the case, exactly. It's so only a matter of time. This is the question I like. Have. Like, think about a platform in which, for example, you can out someone for being homosexual who doesn't right. want to be outed, right? Yeah. So, which I actually happened? You know, this is a crazy, crazy, sad story. Um, on Facebook, do you remember the groups product? Groups. Oh like yeah, yeah, of course I do remember. Yeah. So and they could automatically add you, you to. You could a group. add people to yeah. it. So some, you know, prankster added me and Mike Arrington when we were friends mm -hmm. to Nambla. Yep, I remember. National Man Boy Love Association. I remember. And they added Mark Zuckerberg to it. Mm. So I'm like, okay, this is hysterical, right? Okay, I, I, and I could unfollow it. And Mark Zuckerberg's response was, "You shouldn't be friends with people who do stuff like that." Which I was like, lamest response ever. But he wanted the growth, right? So they build every feature to grow as fast as possible without thinking about what that speed does. Sure. Um, but if you're building a product and you feel it necessary to hire the person who handled the suicide issues at the previous company, might you not want to build that product? I know that in their hearts, they believe that there's goodness that can come out of this application. And they like to highlight it and their supporters like to highlight it, which is people have angst mm. and they need a place to get that angst sure. out in an emotional way. And and I have seen on Secret, because uh, yeah, I downloaded I it three times and I yeah. deleted it three times, I have seen people you know, mm. experimenting with that. I would say, to be honest with you, like if someone really is feeling suicidal or depressed or has serious issues, probably the gut response of people in a mobile app who are untrained are not the best people to be responding to yeah. that. But at least they feel like they have an outlet, I guess. Let's talk about, since we're on the subject, you know, and um, Jody, and you wrote about Jody and just founders and the pressure they're under. And now that you've invested in them and you've bid one, how do you advise your entrepreneurs who are going through the inevitable anxiety, depression, stress that running a startup causes? Well, first of all, on my blog, if you search for it on both sides of the table, there's a blog post called Entrepreneur Shit. Mm -hmm. And I have- Entrepreneur Shit. Yeah. Oh, that's, two, that's 20 bucks in the swear jar. And <laughs> I will give it gladly. <laughs> uh, and 
I tried to write, uh, what I've tried to do throughout my writing time mm. is to give the realism of startups. I wrote also a blog post called um, The Yo-Yo Life of an Entrepreneur, and I talked about how much weight I put on mm. and how much drinking I started doing. Really? And, yeah. And... Uh, I mean, it wasn't like... Were you drinking and eating because your mind was going so fast and you felt like the drinking would turn off your mind a little bit, let you sleep, and the eating would just make you feel good um, after a bad day at the office? I am a stress eater. Ah. Uh, and... You're under um, stress. You just want to get that chicken parm. Me too. I think, you know, honestly, I think like many people, I have an eating addiction. I think it comes from carbohydrates. And it does. Carbohydrates cause you to want to eat more. Yep. And we all deal with stress in different ways. My way is eating. I'm not a big drinker, but I, I, I eat when I'm stressed, and it's not good. It's not healthy. But when I was in my early 30s um, and felt the stress, but it was, it was travel. It was airports, a couple of beers at an airport, yep. a beer when you saw your client, two beers with the new recruiting. Yeah. You know, All of a people. sudden you got six beers in a day. And right. Like, What's going on here? I'm tired and fat. And, uh, and it caused stress. And I got to a point where I was worried about my heart because I was feeling heart palpitations. Oh boy, yeah. It turned out to be acid reflux. And I've written sure. about this before, which is this, every time I tell people this, they're like, oh, my God, I had the exact same experience, right? Like I had heart palpitations. And I tell them, go get looked up for acid reflux, but it comes from stress. But here's the thing is we need to be open about that. We yeah. need to be open about the stresses, about how difficult it is, about the fact that very few startups are total glamour. And mm. it's, it's a lot of fighting with your co-founders. I spend so much time dealing with founder co-fighting. That's why I write about co-founder yeah. co-fighting. And... Uh, so what I try to do is, first of all, instill a sense of realism both into the entrepreneurs and into the people at, in, at large in the companies I invest in. I wrote another blog post called uh, Don't Expect to Strike Lightning in a Bottle. I think people have this uh, film that plays in their head that I launch, and it's all up and to the right. Yeah, good luck and with it's, that. It's years of just hard work grafting it yeah. out, grinding it and out. And then something breaks. You, you get your PewDiePie or whatever and it sometimes is. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, right. right? And you have to be in it for the love of the game. And I know that sounds stupid, but honestly, you really do. And you have to choose, to your point about Secret and other apps, you have to choose something you're deeply passionate about. Right. And otherwise, I think it's soulless being an entrepreneur. If you're driven by money or fame or growth or whatever, I think it's pretty soulless. But I will tell you this, is that I said the job of a CEO is to be chief psychologist, mm. meaning you hire eight or ten great people beneath you. And if you don't hire eight or 10 great people beneath you as you grow your company, it's probably because you're not building a great company. Mm. And then your job is to empower them to make decisions and to help them make decisions. But 10 very talented people are going to fight with people. Marketing wants more money than sales, more more money than editorial, more money than yeah. engineering. And intelligent people debate. The uh, the engineering department feels like they work every freaking weekend so the sales guys can get paid bonuses. The sales guys want to know why the F you haven't shipped your product so that they're losing the competition, right? Like that's life. Tension. Assume, right? And your job is to adjudicate and be chief psychologist. My job as a venture capitalist is to be the CIO, CEO psychologist, right? Mm, yeah. And so I I've noticed with some of my companies when they've gone through super stressful times, I'm at a point where I can no longer challenge and say, why aren't we getting the growth? Why aren't we doing this? And I'm having to pull them out and having very personal conversations mm. and having to lift them up emotionally. And it's important. All right. Co-fighting. Co-founder fighting. Yeah. What do you think is the cause of most fighting um, between co-founders? Well, let's start with a few basic things, which is... Often co-founders don't know each other that well when they start. Right. Even the ones who know each other well, let's say it's a 10-year journey or a 7-year journey. Mm -hmm. And let's say you all start when you're 29. Yep. 29 to 36, what happens? People fall in love. Yeah. People get married. Babies. People have a baby. You find out, and all of this has happened to me in experiences, you find people who start drinking too much. Mm -hmm. You find depression. Uh -huh. You find people who don't come into the office as much. Mm -hmm. um, and you find some people who have really high risk tolerance. I want to build a billion dollar company. And other people who think, no, I want to be conservative. I, if I could make $2 million, that would change my life. 
So your incentives are not always aligned. I don't so. believe in this co-founder nonsense. I think it could be sole founders. But do you know that I'm the most public guy on this topic? No. I wrote a blog post, you should read it, called oh. the co-founder mythology. I went to Stanford and I delivered a speech in the heart You're of kidding. Silicon we Valley think the same about called this. the co-founder mythology. And what I argue is, here's my argument, Jason, real quickly. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Is that no, I want to hear it. You should hire your co-founders. And here's what I mean. I, that's what I do. If you start with 100%, and let's say you raise capital and give away 20% to your capital. Yeah, 50 left. You can do whatever you want. You can bring in someone for 3%, 5%, 10%, sure. 40%, right? It's up to you, but you're still in charge. You still control voting. You should treat them like a founder. Be open with your financials and how much equity you have, how much they have. Sure. Involve them in decision making. But if you ever fall out of love, you have a prenup. Right. Right? And Investing so of stock. The other thing I should tell you is I talk to incredibly talented people who are afraid of taking risks. They don't manifest that in their own mind that way, but they will gladly join a company for 2% that has, that has been de-risked. For one percent that has been de-risked, so and de risk I say means you've like, raised a little capital, you've yeah. got the idea, you've got the yeah. business plan, the website, the prototype, mm -hmm. whatever. So if I go to you and say, you know what, Jason, I've decided to give you ten percent. Hmm. I mean, fuck me, who gives ten percent to yeah. anybody, right? right? It doesn't happen. Right. It's a myth if you think it happens. But if you go in and you own the majority of the company to begin with, you have that flexibility. That's always what I, I mean. It's interesting. It's like you're talking to me as an entrepreneur because I, I always try to have a great founding team. Yes. And I don't feel the need, at least especially at this point in my career, to monopolize the founder title. I feel mm -hmm. like it's kind of petty. Sure. So I have people from like the Weblogs Inc. days, you know, who were like came in in month 12 or month 18 or month six, and I let them call themselves totally founders. It doesn't take anything away from me. Everybody knows I was the boss man. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it, 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 this idea that, like, there could only be certain people founders. I told everybody who's on the inside team, if you were here the moment we launched and went in the app store, you're a founder. That's it. Call yourself a founder. Even you want to say some, founding team member, whatever. Even sometimes, if you go on an eight-year journey yeah. and someone joined you in month nine, but they were one of the critical players. Sure, why not? So I talk about a lot of my ex-employees or people that I worked with yeah. as founders. Of course. Okay, let's have a question from the audience. Go. Let's see this one. Hi, Jason. My co-founders and I recently started our venture in cloud hosting, in which we provide redundant cloud backup solutions to our customers. We're really excited about our venture, and after watching your interview with Mitch Weiner, we're ecstatic to hear you say that there's an actual need for this service. Great. So my question to you, since we are just starting up, is should we continue bootstrapping our business, or should we try to get into an accelerator like Techstars? Or even better, when would be the best time for us to start seeking venture capital? All right, so let's... Any just... feedback you... Let's assume here that the person has a functioning product and some clients. Should a person with a functioning team, product, and clients go into an accelerator or seek funding? So the golden rule of any dial-in or opportunity to speak up is at least say your brand name. So I know. That was very cur I was like, let's get a plug for this guy. Le Find out the plug, Gina. He, he told us everything that we did except the company name. So you should start with my name. I was waiting for the plug. Mark Suster. I work for Upfront Ventures, right? Exactly. Like, um, so here's what I tell people is... First of all, if you don't know if there's product market fit, you're far better off taking seed money, angel money, accelerator money, keep your amount of money small. Hmm. Because if you end up building something that isn't going to be huge, if you raise a million dollars, you can still sell for five or six and make a bit of money if you've never made money in your life. The minute you take three, five, seven million dollars from a VC, you have one outcome, which is big. Hmm. And there, if you know in your bones you are in this to build a big business, then there is no better way to do that, in my opinion, than to raise venture capital. Um, what have you learned now that you've been at it for five years investing that uh, you didn't know when you started? Wish you knew you started, you know, that's a standard question. It is easy to write checks. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest part of our business. It's yeah. the thing we brag about the most. Mm -hmm. Um, it is very hard to drive returns. Mm -hmm. We read TechCrunch or Inside or Recode or whatever every day. Mm -hmm. 
and we read the news and we read about the Maker Studio exit, yeah. or even we read about a Gravity exit for $92 million, and you think, God, it's easy. I could just build a company and sell it for $40 million, right. and I'm going to make my mint. It is so hard to get someone to buy your company and to pay you lots of money. Hmm. And so I think I underestimated how hard exits are. Hmm. And also that even if you're going to get an exit, how do you get an exit that delivers significant multiple returns on invested capital? Because in today's market, entrepreneurs have a lot of power to drive up prices that you have to pay to get involved. So if you're getting in at a $10 million valuation and you're looking to sell for $25 million, there's no returns in that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think of the market today? Are you sitting it out? Are you making many investments? Can you make any sense of Fred, the valuations? Fred Wilson gave me the best advice, and he said, Mark, you simply can't be out of market when you think prices are high. He said, uh, 2007 is when I invested in Twitter. Right. Right? And that drove enormous returns right. for him. I remember that because it was a $30 million valuation, and I was discussing it with everybody who was involved. And... There was a lot of debate of if Twitter was worth $30 million at that point. It was and like, then someone invested at 100 and everyone said yeah, they were crazy, Bijan. right? Bijan and, uh, right? The Bijan and uh, uh, Spark Capital. Spark came Spark in. Spark did 100. And, every, I, and I, e I have the email to him saying, brilliant move. I know everybody thinks you're an idiot. Brilliant move. Hmm. And he saved that email. Right. Uh, so um, anyway, it's, yeah. it's, it's a hard business. Prices are being driven up. <clears throat> I, I like to say I'm willing to pay the top end of normal. Mm. Top so end of normal. So if I think normally a venture back company raising a million to two million should be raising in the four to $6 million pre-money range, mm -hmm. and I see something I just love, I'll pay eight pre. Like if I feel like they've built so much innovation and I need to be a part of it, but I won't pay 30 pre for a startup, like something that doesn't have real customer traction yeah. or real proof or whatever. So I'll pay the top end of normal. Uh, final question. Know you love Naval and AngelList. You've been very positive about that. The syndicates are starting to happen. Yes. I just did my first one. It was way oversubscribed. It's great. Congrats. Put 50K into com.com and the syndicate put in over 300. So now I become like, a little mini VC I own, yep. like double digit percentages of a company. How do you view the the entry of myself, you know, whoever else is doing this, uh, Gil, you know, a couple of people are doing it. What do you think that impact is gonna have, if any? Or is it just like there's another little mini VC going on? I think it's super healthy. Okay. And here's why. As a VC, there's only so many times I can write a $250,000, $500,000 check in something that's super early stage. Mm -hmm. So if there are talented people like you who are willing to fund them through their initial phases, I don't mind paying up for the next round. Yeah. Um, but then I get a look at stuff that's more qualified. So if the top end of the funnel is wider for venture capitalists and we have to pay a slightly higher price to have more validated ideas, that's just fine for me. Um, I think that people like you and me are very complimentary, right? Yeah. Because you're going to write many checks and you don't have the time or capacity to sit in the board meeting no. and deal with the conflicts that arise on no. a daily basis. No. And, uh, and that's my job. Like right. I sit on, I do, I have eight to 10 investments at any time maximum personally. I mean, our right. fund will have 40, but I'll have eight or 10 and I spend a lot of time. Uh, you overlap the funds now, like, and, and is that the name of the game in VCs? Is like you wind up like, you're you've got you're on six boards from the last fund, one board from the fund before that, and two in the new fund. Well, so there's a couple different things when people talk about overlapping funds. One is if you overlap a fund, in ter like I raise a fund and then I raise another one three years later. Mm. You have fees from fund one and fees from fund two. So that's, so that's what people. Juicy. People That's love what that. people talk about when they talk about overlapping yeah. funds. The these VCs get paid a million dollars a year, right? Two What's million, that? A lot of these VCs are getting paid a million, you know, two million really, dollars a year in fees. So let me answer that in a second. Yeah. I'll answer the exact question. But secondly, you have something called a crossover where mm -hmm. maybe I invest $2 million from fund one and $3 million from fund two. Oh, wow. VCs try hard not to do that. Why? Because you get into conflicts. Like, ah. is fun? They may not have the exact same limited partners right. investing so in each of those. Right. So is fund three making up for is the mistakes of fund two? Yep. Or, or fund two may say that's bullshit. I wanted that investment from our pool of oh, capital. Boy. You put 
money that should have gone for Uber's growth Woo. from the, from another LP. Barbecue right? sauce. Right? So it's re you really don't want to do that if you don't have to do that. Um, so that's, I think, what people talk about when they talk about crossover funds. In terms of as a board member, mm -hmm. of course, I'm still on boards from Fund 3, from Upfront mm -hmm. Ventures, and I'm on boards from Upfront 4. Mm -hmm. Next year uh, or the following year or whenever we raise another fund, um, then I'll be on boards from Upfront 5. But over time, the Upfront 3 commitments will go down, right, and Upfront 5 commitments will go up. But but also, you know, we've added new partners. We added Greg Bettinelli. We yeah. added Hame Watt. And we will continue to add partners. And so all that can be found at Upfront. Upfront.com. You got Upfront.com? Oh, yeah. Nicely done. You think I would have Upfront Ventures with that Upfront.com? Of course. Very well done. Listen, everybody can follow. Are you M. Suster? At M. Suster. M-S-U-S-T-E-R. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, both sides of the table.com. Yes. Uh, recently redesigned. Looks beautiful, by Thank the way. Thank you. I appreciate and it. And listen, congratulations. I mean, Gravity was a great win, but Maker, just huge. And uh, you've always been so uh, honest and upfront, and you're such a good friend to entrepreneurs. It's just a pleasure to have you back. Thank on you. But can I answer that question only because I don't want to dodge it about how much VCs make? Oh, yeah. They make a million, two million bucks a year? So if they have a small fund or they're a junior partner, they're making a lot less than you what think. What do you think a junior partner is making? 250 Probably well, at a big fund. Yeah. Probably more like five, six, seven hundred. Okay. So mm -hmm. junior partners at a big half fund. Mil. At a big fund. Like a Sequoia benchmark. Yes. And Hearts. Without a doubt. Five hundred thousand. Without a doubt. So they're going to ask. At a at a at a small ish fund, they could be paying themselves one hundred and fifty k. Right. Right. So my fund, a, ten million dollar fund, I get zero. There's a wide range. If you are a senior partner in a fund that's been around for forty years and has a billion dollars per fund, you might be paying yourself two or three million. Wow. Yeah. Is it the I'm greatest not. gig ever? I'm not. Is it the greatest gig ever? I mean, you were an entrepreneur. Like, would you ever go back to being an entrepreneur? This is just, this is just too much fun and here's, awesome. Here's how I talk about it all the time. This is the absolute truth, Jason, yeah. is if you can be on the court, you want to be on the court. If there's 12 seconds lame left in the game, give yeah. me the fucking ball. You I want to take the shot, right? Really? But, the but what, you don't have the energy? You get, you get to 40 and it's just like, oh, God, I don't know if I can put myself through this anymore. I don't know if I want to say it's energy, but... I ha I still work pretty hard. You work pretty hard, but I have two kids yeah. and a family, and I care deeply about them. And the commitments that are required to do a startup are all-consuming. And it's not just about time; it's about the stresses of it. It's yeah. about the all-consuming nature of it. I mean, Never, some people believe it's a young man's game. I often back people in their 40s. I've done it many times, so I'm not going to say that you can't do that. And I'm fine with the times I've done it. But I think it does favor young people, and I think on an energy base. But you have you would, Mark Pincus, yeah. and you have Craig's from Craigslist. Craig and Mark. I personally have backed yeah. many people in their 40s, yeah. and I will continue to do so. Maybe even their 50s, who knows? But they just have to have that energy. Let's say for me personally, yeah. if you can't hit the three pointers anymore, if you're yeah. not running as fast as the young the knees kids, getting swelled up, at some point you become a better coach. Yeah, and I think I'm a pretty good coach, Excellent. and I try to spend my time coaching people if i could be on the court i'd be on the court in a in a nanosecond but i'm enjoying it i wrote another blog post called you'd have to be a pretty big baby to complain about being a vc right because smart people God, come man. tell me how they want to change the world if i like it they open up the kimono and show me absolutely everything and yeah. i can spend as much time with i and want you're like here here's something to help you have make your dreams i'm being the fucking wizard of oz i get paid to network i get paid to travel i get oh, paid you need to a work brain, with smart you need a heart, people courage right? here's your courage so Go. you'd have to be a big baby to complain about being a VC. All right, just wrapping up here. Thanks to our sponsors, Scott Ed Walker and New Relic. Thank you, Brandis, producer Gina, Andrew, Jade, Emily, and you meant the launch ticker before, not inside. Uh, but yes, uh, Demont, Luke, Brandon. I did mean that, sorry. Yeah, yeah it's fine. I, so I have two, that was my minimal viable product yes. that I put into market to just test the concept. Um, hey, listen, executive producers, Magnus, um, Grow Dental, Marianne Halford, thank you for being executive producers. Uh, our regular producers, Anthony Ortiz. Jeffrey Hoffer, Marcos Trinidad, Greg Meadows, Lisa Jones, Michael Pidgeot, Jose Fuentes, Austin Miller, William Paletto, Louis Eric Samar, James Schutte, Shelley Gaskin. I hope I'm pronouncing all this right. Great producers and super fans. Michael Hunt, Samuel Seymour Butts, Driz Mala, Proclip, Asia Limited, Joshua Rosen, and Relso PTE Limited. Thank you so much for uh, contributing uh, to make this week in startups uh, an independent meeting like this uh, awesome thanks again to our friends at swell stitcher and itunes for featuring the program in the last um 
couple of weeks. I do appreciate that as well. And you can join us uh, as well if you want to have your name read out loud and be part of the Twist family at twistlist.co. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.